Hello everybody, let me introduce myself. My name is Mirka Goldenhan and I am resident artist and head of visual arts at Lilce Creative. I would like to welcome you all to the Maker's Tale online panel discussion and thank you all for joining us. I am thrilled that despite the cancellation of Salisbury International Arts Festival, for which this exhibition was intended for, Wilcher Creative is able to bring a version of Maker's Tale online. The exhibition catalogue, which you can see and read on our website, and this panel discussion is brought to you by Wilcher Creative Connects. Wilcher Creative Connects is the platform for our online programming. What you will see for now is really only a fraction of the work which over the last year went into the project. And we are looking forward to the day when we will be able to present Maker's Tale as a physical exhibition. 2020 is a remarkable year for Salisbury. It is the year of the 800th anniversary of the relocation of the most significant building in the city. In 1220, Salisbury Cathedral moved from its original and unsuitable site to its current site. As part of the celebrations of this act of courage, creativity and innovation, our festival was designed to scrutinize the themes of movement through its cultural programming. In the festival exhibition, I was keen to use the theme of movement as a means to shed a light onto the movement of ideas, techniques and concepts between creative disciplines. To examine how this sort of movement occurs within a broader craft practice in particular seem an obvious uh, way to go because of the legacy of the cathedral's move, the skill and craftsmanship associated with this. And so supported by our artistic director Gareth Machin, a concept hutch which set out to explore the acts of disciplinary crossovers as well as passing on skills, acts of teaching and learning and acts of the passage of inspiration. Having lived in Salisbury for over 20 years, um, I'm very well aware of the significance of the cathedral with its works department. Here, skill is passed from the master to the apprentice and so this particular setup presents a continuum of learning spanning the time between 1200s and now. At the private view of the last year's festival exhibition, Insatiable Mind, I struck a conversation about the future with Lucia Monopolo. I have known Lucia for some years and I am very well aware of her particular expertise in the field of contemporary craft and cross-disciplinary practice. Lucia is at present PhD candidate at UCA Farnham. When Lucia pr proposed a collaboration, I knew that there could be no better person to work with in order to bring together the creative legacy of the Salisbury Cathedral in combination with the current practice inquiry into an expanded field of craft happening at UCA. First of all, Salisbury Cathedral supported the project by opening their doors and took in a large group of UCA students to explore behind the scenes. Allow me to welcome to the panel Salisbury Cathedral representative Canon Robert Titley. Robert is a canon treasurer of Salisbury Cathedral and he is also the chair of the Cathedral's Arts Committee. Robert, Salisbury Cathedral is an incredible learning resource 
charged with the energy of knowledge acquired over the last 800 years. How do you see this role of the cathedral moving forward into the future? And please, could you also tell us about the role that craft plays in the current day-to-day -day life of the cathedral? Thank you, Birka. Thanks for, for um, uh, welcoming uh, me uh, in this company today. And um, thank you, yes, thank you for the question. Um, talk about us quite rightly as being uh, this this extraordinary repository of, of, of learning and knowledge um, the cathedral also was conceived as and it remains a, a, a place of encounter uh, there's a distinction in French there's the verb savoir to know stuff and techniques and and the word connaître which is to know a person and the cathedral has existed um, not only to be a place that, as it were, gives information about God and faith, but also to facilitate an encounter uh, with, 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 with God. And um, that role remains the same as it was 800 years ago and before that, when we were up at uh, Old Serum in, on the unsuitable site, as you call it, quite rightly. Um, what, what is different, of course, is that in each age that, that task changes because cultures shift, perceptions shift, and, and uh, if you are to be intelligible and, uh, and, and, and compelling, you, you, you have to change in response to the environment in which you find yourself. And the work of our team of craftspeople, it, it, it's, it's a fantastic part of my job to have a particular responsibility for our uh, craftsmen and women in the works department. Um, their job in the first place is, 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 is to uh, preserve and conserve uh, so that the next 800 years will, will have a Salisbury Cathedral uh, uh, as, as, as part of its story as the previous 800 have been. But of course, every time you um, engage with the building, conserving a piece of stone, uh, repairing a piece of stained glass, uh, you are actually engaged in a, in a creative act as well. And you, you, as it were, add add your uh, sentence to the to, to, to the story. So that there's there's a there's a there's a wonderful melting of the of the walls between past and present as we uh, try to ready ourselves for the future. Thank you, thank you, Robert, for your answer. And let me now introduce you to Lucia Monopolo, who will introduce all the artists who are part of our panel today. Hello everyone, uh, good morning. Thank you Mirka for the brilliant introduction. Thank you everyone for um, being here today. Um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction about the concept of the exhibition and then present the artist and then um, the artist will um, start the conversation. So uh, the exhibition was programmed for the Salisbury Arts Centre and it was to bring together artists and students from the UCA and invite them to explore the notion of movement of ideas, of making and the transfer of knowledge. I mean, what best place to actually explore and be influenced for, this, um, for that exploration but the Salisbury Cathedral. Uh, it is an invitation, it was an invitation to tell their own story, whatever form it takes, its maker's tale is nearly sacramental. This means that their stories, the narratives of making, are rooted deeply in time and place. What brings these storytellers together isn't some time-worn oral narrative or tradition. It is the narrative amplitude of craft. Maker's tale and the storytellers communicate a continuum, continuum of life and craft making. Space, place, and the making process becomes visible and audible within the exhibition. Captured with new technologies, it is no longer so easily hidden from view. Yet, the very nature of the making process may never fully be revealed. It is a credit to the maker's abilities as storytellers that we can picture the movement of ideas, of making and the transfer of knowledge. The contemporary craft included in the exhibition are metalwork, glass, textile and ceramics, and we have a new music composition um, um, for um, the exhibition. So the artists are Kara Wassenberg, who uses steel, copper and glass to develop contemporary sculptures 
which are made using a combination of traditional coaching and casting techniques. Peter Jacob, research-based practice, applies textile thinking to investigate the paradox of immaterial substance explained by both quantum physics and Eastern mystical experience. Manuela Kagerbauer uses a combination of traditional and digital craft methods. Her work aims to raise the awareness and understanding of visual in, uh, impermanence. Hermione Thompson combines felt, the oldest known textile, with an innovative bioresin to consider loss. Michelle Sills, process-based creative practice, features a constant interplay of traditional and digital techniques. Michelle will use dust from the stone masonry works yard to 3D print a new body of ceramic works. Dr. Harry Wally and Amy Sophia Brown are working on a new music composition, Plagency, which captures the unknown and the unnoticed sounds of the cathedral, as well as the sounds of the making process. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. <laughs> so, Harry, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a really interesting project uh, and it kind of keeps getting more interesting as it as it goes on. Um, uh, on the surface when Lucia first um, uh, approached me about about this project um, it was I suppose it took a little while to understand really what what it was about. Um, on the surface it's to celebrate uh, an outstanding um, building um, and uh, and the activities that have been going on in that space for so many uh, hundreds of years. Um, but it's actually a lot more than that because it's really about understanding uh, the fabric of the building in, not, uh, in, in every sense of the word fabric. Um, so to, to think about a musical composition that takes those aspects of um, the building and, uh, and its activities into account uh, and not just the canon of um, musical history, because of course the, the building has its own musical canon, uh, has its own musical history of choirs and the organ in particular. But to think about a composition that um, looks forward in terms of the history of the building as a whole and the making of it and the actual structure uh, is a really interesting uh, challenge. Um, and to be working on something at the same time as contemporary practitioners and makers um, who have the same approach. They, they understand the history of, of, of their craft, but are also looking forward uh, is a really exciting thing and um, makes the compositional process something which is not um, so much. So you don't feel so isolated. Sometimes it's quite an isolated feeling thing, uh, isolated thing. So I feel that it connects it both to the history, but also to the community that I see on my screen in front of me now. So the, the cathedral creates an acoustic space so that the, the gaps, the air between the actual services is something that we can explore. Um, it has a, some amazing acoustic properties which were designed to project um, voice and organ and other instruments across an incredible expanse of space. Um, so when you're in the cathedral itself and you stand and make noise in different parts of that, um, uh, of the floor, um, the way that that sound then is enveloped in that space um, changes, or, you know, to, huge, uh, to a huge degree. So for instance, if you're in the choir stalls, it feels like you're in somebody's living room and you could have a conversation very easily, but that sound gets projected all the way down to the back wall. So it has very carefully uh, cr crafted, um, uh, a very sophisticated form of, of acoustics. I think it's interesting now that acoustics is sort of heavily computer modeled and still slightly a mysterious um, subject. Um, but yet the, the builders of this uh, cathedral understood these things and were able to, to work with it. So the way uh, this uh, project has been approached was to 
go into the cathedral in uh, the evening. And actually, James Armstrong, Dr. James Armstrong, who I can see as an attendee, um, who has a PhD in um, uh, uh, music and psychology, helped um, create what's called impulse responses of the um, uh, of the space. We use two approaches. Um, one approach is popping balloons. So essentially, when you pop a balloon, it um, uh, it's a loud bang, obviously. Uh, but that bang contains a whole range of frequencies, um, some very low frequencies and very high frequencies. And importantly, they're quite uniformly distributed and as one moment in time, a very short impulse. So if you pop a balloon in a space and then record how that echo um, reverb reverberates uh, with some microphones, and then uh, analyze that, you can get a signature of how those frequencies individually die down over time. Um, so that response then you can use to um, create a, a, a model, or an acoustic model, which you can then play other sounds through, which means you can take um, sounds that were, were recorded elsewhere and play them back as if they were in that acoustic environment. And our idea with the physical performance was to then have an array of speakers that play back the reverberance. So we were able to take the, the, the sort of essential nature of the reverberation of Salisbury Cathedral and implant that into the art center. And Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself and, uh, and briefly um, go through the three questions about your practice? Yes, thanks Lucia. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Michelle Shields. I'm a technical tutor at uh, UCA in ceramics. I'm very much um, a multidisciplinary maker. So I've been trained in wood, metal, glass and ceramics. My master's was in metal work. And I really respond to the world around me um, just about the materiality. So especially with Salisbury Cathedral, the materiality of place was really a starting point for a body of work. Um, because I'm a ceramicist and I'm curious about materials, you know, why this material? Um, I love working with the rawness um, of clay, our local material, um, you know, digging up local clay. And I think what struck me about the cathedral was the, the dust that was coming from the stonemason's workshop. And I, I wanted to use that as a starting point to wedge into the porcelain. And then you have a material I can then work with um, in a di digital process um, and that was the curious nature uh, is sort of archiving materials um, for unexpected results um, to see what I can create really and that that's what my my practice is is based on um, so the three elements are really a sort of collision between uh, digital new technologies new new ways of thinking and making but always making hybrid, so connecting that with the handmade and the craft, old techniques. Um, and then also the raw materials as well. So in, in, an, in an experimental fashion, what happens if I fire limestone from the cathedral, um, a waste material um, from the cathedral stonemasons, which has this wonderful lineage of 800 years. Um, and what can start to happen in different quantities of using this material in combination with porcelain, which is a very sort of expensive material. And we, we can, that material resonates with us, uh, the purity of, of um, porcelain. So that, that was really my, my starting point after visiting the, the cathedral and, and seeing the stonemasons at work um, and, and also wanting to sort of embrace their materiality into my world of digital craft. Can I also ask you to um, give us two lines about, because you worked with the students to create the body of work that will be part of um, the exhibition. Could you just uh, share with us a couple of, um, you know, something about 
you know how this how the students found working with you know find inspiration from cathedral hard was working with them with yeah the i think yeah it was a, a wonderful springboard for them because again they're they're working in um, a material fashion uh, like i am so glass students and ceramic students so it was really a great springboard for them to document um, the cathedral and then again work experimentally and push boundaries of, of what they're already um, sort of thinking and making. Thank you. Um, so we ask um, Hermione to talk about uh, her practice. Hello Hermione. And also in the end if you can add a couple of lines about your experience working with your students in textiles department. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Hermione, I'm a textile teacher and artist living in Hampshire, working in Surrey and I'm also the Art in Residence at the University for the Creative Arts in Farnham. Um, my work that um, is going to be showing at the Maker's Tale exhibition when it happens is uh, my MA work which surrounds the theme of loss I made um, three-dimensional forms, abstract uh, pieces, ranging in size that um, I wanted to convey the emotional charge um, using a range of contemporary processes and uh, traditional materials as well, using felt and jesmonite and actually human hair, so that the human condition um, was conveyed through those uh, materials and processes alike. Um, so I ran, um, thank you. <laughs> so I ran some workshops at, at the uh, university um, where we were making uh, handmade handmaking um, felt, um, along with uh, some jesmonite casting workshops as well. And it's this really interesting um, juxtaposition of uh, fusing hard and soft materials together that really excites me in my work, as well as um, researching really important and um, profound um, artists, because of course we been making um, throughout time as a means to act as a cathartic um, uh, measure and uh, act when dealing with grief. I'm, I'm afraid I come with a bit of a heavy heart today. I actually attended my mother-in-law's funeral yesterday. And, um, but it's again with, with, with this act of making to process one's grief, we actually come together and obviously being a sign of the times at the moment, um, it is a, it is a way of connecting with others. So running these workshops with students was um, really important for me, and as a teacher, is really important um, in terms of learning new skills myself and moving those forward and sharing them with others. And the students were fantastic; they embraced um, the workshops um, really imaginatively. It was an experimental um, approach and uh, they all took something from it. Um, in fact, I was working along with other teachers and artists who provided um, other processes for the students to take on board. Um, and so it's very exciting to see them mix up these um, different medias that you wouldn't ordinarily see. So um, some students were working with indigo, again, a very old, um, process indigo dyeing and mixing that into the jazz line came out with some really exciting um, pieces which um, I'm sure everyone will look forward to seeing um, along along with uh, my work as well I hope. Thank you Hermione. Uh, so shall we move to uh, Peter? Okay thank you. It's lovely to uh, be with everybody today. Um, so my uh, background is a textile background, um, having studied at UCA, um, though it has evolved to a very mixed media background. I haven't been loyal to my textile um, material. Um, I work with all sorts of different materials and also with um, film and animation. 
Um, my main inspiration is light. And um, relating back to the cathedral, I've always been one of my favorite parts of any cathedral are the stained glass windows and how light is captured through the colors in the stained glass and cast onto the surface um, of the walls and floors of the cathedral. So um, my main um, focus is on light's relationships with materials. Um, and um, I investigate um, the, the way that it uh, acts with surface, passes through materials, um, and is reflected off materials. Um, and um, I'm also interested in what happens internally with um, uh, transparent materials like prisms. Um, a, a deeper study of light took me to looking at the quantum aspect of light. So um, I've been investigating the really strange paradoxical world um, of quantum behavior. Um, and to materialize some of those peculiar ideas and peculiar observations, um, I took inspiration from a quantum physicist called David Bohm, who described quantum aspects in terms of a textile term of unfolding and enfolding of uh, matter. Um, and so I've taken some of those ideas into my artwork and um, used them to unfold light, um, unfold all the spectrum colors that are tightly um, held inside light um, and reveal them. Um, and um, so uh, underlying all my artwork is this textile background and the use of textile thinking. Um, textile thinking enables a kind of uh, much more whole point of view um, with ideas of interweaving. Um, so the interconnectedness that quantum physics reveals at, at the base of all matter um, can be more fully explored. Um, so I'm really, really interested in materials. So I use a wide range of materials and I bring my textile training to bear on those materials and explore them and push the limits of them. Um, interrogating them to uh, present these quantum themes. Um, for instance, I use dichroic materials, which uh, uh, when you look at it from different angles, present different colors, um, and also uh, materials that will um, unfold light, for instance, um, diffraction. Um, dif diffractive materials will unfold the, the spectrum inside light. So I use those within my artworks. Um, and um, so it's a way of bringing very, very difficult ideas to some kind of material form. Um, the question that people often ask me is, well, what do physicists think of the way that you look at their world? Um, and um, I'm very happy that they can see um, and understand um, what I'm presenting. Um, and um, have, you know, I have artworks hanging in a, a, a physics um, um, facility. Um, so uh, uh, they're very happy that they've got some art that expresses their world. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's brilliant. And uh, Cara, would you um, like to present yourself? And I'm going to present a couple of slides of uh, your work. Um, hello, I'm Cara, Cara Wassenberg. Um, and I work in, in metal and cast glass. Um, I have a workshop in Hampshire, which is near Petersfield, um, in Petersfield, near Ham in Hampshire. And I make work to commission and for galleries. And I also teach at uh, West Dean College for Art and Conservation nearby. Um, 
I studied uh, at UCA in Farnham and I, I completed an, an, a master's degree there. And Lucia asked me to exhibit um, a piece that I made during my final year degree show. It's called A Thousand Degrees and it is made from cast glass, um, bronze and forged steel. Uh, my, uh, my background is, uh, I, I originally studied fine art, but then I got very involved in blacksmithing and trained as, as a blacksmith and worked with many people, um, both in England and abroad. Um, and so when I came to uh, UCA to, to do my MA, I really wanted to bring more light and translucency into my work, finding forged steel and copper uh was was i loved the forging process but I, I was finding i was looking for something more so um i enjoy uh i really enjoy the the, the challenge of, of creating three-dimensional forms and and how they sit spatially within with within a, an environment and with the piece 1000 degrees um i wanted to 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 create a piece that hung uh, within an environment, but also explored my, uh, so to speak, journey between working in metal and my newly adopted uh, uh, work process in, in glass. So when you look at the piece hanging, you can see how uh, it, the, you move between the, the different materials of, of metal and glass. Um, I was really drawn to glass because of its uh, its translucency and lightness and the way that it holds the light. Um, it also can be cast from a form that I can make within steel. And, uh, and as you can probably tell, I'm really process led within my work. I'm fascinated by process. And so by the some of the nostalgia and some of the beauty of the craft process for example in in iron work um and that's why I, i'm i'm so pleased to be able to exhibit this piece because there are so many links with tradition for example in salisbury cathedral there's a, a lot of iron work and, and also a lot of glass perhaps not so much cast glass but but those materials are very present but just to go back to the glass again, the other thing that is fascinating is how by taking a steel form and casting it in glass, you can see the inside of the form from through the glass, which of course in the steel you, you never can. And you can see this in the piece, a thousand degrees. Um, why do I use, why am I drawn to the material of steel? Well, it's like my old friend it's 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 i know what i can expect from steel it i know how thin i can forge it and how strong it can still still be there is a great beauty to that it also takes on the texture of of the hammer the power hammer or my own just like if i'm using a hand hammer uh and and there's a, an implication within within the steel um or the steel form uh, for for the tools and a reference towards tools and machinery and <clears throat> the whole agricultural practice of tools using tools and machinery is also something that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and so the last material that's in the piece, a thousand degrees, is um, bronze. And this was completely new new experience for me to use bronze and. Again, this is a material that I, I know is in the cathedral as well. Um, bronze is, uh, it really is probably a piece of bronze is only as good as the casting process that's been used within its making. And, uh, the, but, but what I found is I wanted to bring a sense of tension or suspense or some, some sort of, um, uh, uh, something of, of these qualities into the piece and the bronze can mimic another, through the casting process, you can mimic another material. And in a thousand degrees, I've chosen to, to sort of mimic the, the, the material of uh, fabric, fabric material, which brings a sort of uh, tension to the piece because you expect the fabric to be soft, but of course it's bronze, so it's hard. 
And when you look at the piece, you can see this. Um, so just to sum up the, 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 the distinct properties of the materials I've chosen here, the glass is for its translucency and its transparency, and also for the watery shadow that it will cast as it's, as it's hanging, if it, if it is uh, um, able to be hung in Salisbury Art Center. Um, the steel for its strength and its texture, and, um, and then the, the combination of the three, because all of those materials can be shaped and formed using the craft process to, to fit in some way with the other. Uh, and so they can all be joined together to, to, to make a hum, homogenous piece. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cara. Um, so uh, Manuela is not able to join us today because of um, personal issues. So I'm gonna share my screen with Manuela's work and I'm gonna read her reply on um, about her work and her practice. Share screen. So um, Manuela Kagebauer, she says, I create visually stimulating and immersive installations using mixed media with a focus on technical materials, often incorporating glass. Through my work, I express my interest in representing the early symptoms of macular degeneration, a visual impairment. People with this sight deficiency can experience rough, um, warped lines and movements like an optical illusion. I like the mountability of metal and the fragility of glass. I enjoy exploring the possibilities of both materials, pushing the boundaries of what is technically achievable. The interaction between the viewer and the object is very important to me. I want my work to be an experience. It is with my geometric repeat patterns I create the physical effects experience. Using Illustrator together with the laser cutter enables me to speed up this process of research into my study of patterns. I see digital technology as another tool that enables me to make models of objects that I sometimes wouldn't be able to make by hand or it would be a lot more time consuming. But all of my work involves black and white drawings. With altered vision, I'm recreating symptoms for people to experience when standing in front of and looking through. I, want to, I wanted to transform a two-dimensional surface into a three-dimensional effect and allow the viewers to experience the alteration in vision. I experimented with lots of materials to achieve the desired result, but finally choosing copper foil over a mesh. It had to be rigid enough to hang straight yet delicate enough to move as someone walks in. I used water jet to cut out the octagons and they are slightly pushed out of the foil, creating an optical illusion that plays with sight and sensorial perception. The material used just copper and oxidized copper to create a high contrast. I don't really use color. I like to let the material speak for itself and prefer to use patterns or negative space to create the impact I'm looking for. So what I realize is there's a lot of crossovers uh, between all of us. I mean, we knew that, but even in the introductions, you can see that everyone is trying to push the boundaries of their own material, uh, try to do cross-disciplinary, um, um, you know, um, um, include the cross-disciplinary practices. So I was thinking, um, Mirka, shall we move on to the questions we have for today? Thank you for the introductions. And um, let's start the questions now. So the question number one is about experiencing lockdown. It is something that cannot escape. Um, so I will ask the question. Due to the lockdown, we are witnessing a new trend of moving exhibitions and events into a virtual online environment. What do you think are the main differences between experiencing the work online in contrast to experiencing the work in physical form? Does craft knowledge convey similarly in physical and virtual form? And I would like to actually read firstly Manuela's reply because she's not here and um, she had sent her replies. And this one is particularly interesting to start this off. Um, Manuela is saying, 
My work involves the viewer. I want to experience the beautiful, but also slightly disorienting physical effects one can have through looking at my work. This is very difficult to reproduce virtually or almost impossible. It will become an object rather than an experience. And I think that is a very good point that Manuela is putting there. And I wonder if I can lead now to Robert and hear from his experiences before we move on to the rest of the panel. Yes, thank you. Uh, we, we're in a similar position with uh, a, a big exhibition we conceived two years ago uh, for our 800th anniversary year, celebrating 800 years of spirit endeavour, it's called. And uh, although some of the pieces are in the cathedral close, and therefore, during your permitted daily exercise, you can come and engage with them corporeally, as it were, in the real world. Uh, at least half the pieces are inside the cathedral and are therefore behind locked doors. So we have had to do a similar exercise to the one you're, you're talking about, which is to uh, um, realize or reimagine the exhibition as a, as a virtual and an online experience. Um, and there's a lot you can say about the demerits of that, the deficit that you get. There's a kind of um, flattening perhaps of the experience um, you can't walk around a piece and see it uh, in, um, uh, in, with a different fall of light from one angle or another. Or if you do, it's curated for you by a camera that's going around the object. But um, there is, I think, one, well, it's a discovery we, we've, we've, we've made. Uh, um, I have a, at least one response to our online exhibition, which says, actually, I have mobility, mobility difficulties. I could not have experienced this exhibition at all had it not been realised as a virtual experience as well as a, an in real life one. So th there's actually something uh, democratising and inclusive about an online realisation of, of art, uh, which, which, as it were, is able to pass through closed doors and people who are confined to home are, are able to experience something that they would not be able to experience uh, otherwise. Um, interestingly, in three, now two minutes, uh, my colleagues are engaging in uh, Zoom prayers at midday. We have one person participating in that who is terminally ill, is able to do it from his bed. If we were holding a service in the cathedral, he couldn't get within a country mile of it. So um, there, 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 there are things to celebrate as, as well as things to acknowledge as, as limitations in a virtual realisation of art and other things. Thank you. I think in the context of this question, for artists and makers who work with material, the sensation of touch yeah, is very right. important when communicating with the audience. And I was wondering if one of the artists who work with material would like to come in at this point. Um, I think that the, the um, my feeling was yes, from, from the point of view of touch and temperature with the materials, like I'm using steel and glass, so you know it, how they hold the warmth. That obviously can't be experienced, and 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 that is a negative thing. But I think that the thing that I have been doing recently is doing some online videos from my workshop, some little films just taken with my camera, which then have, have put on like with the Westin website, and people have said that 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 is actually makes it even more accessible because really normally I wouldn't ask that many people into my workshop and it helps me focus on the process I'm using but also it links uh, with the sound and I know we're talking about this more but with the sound of a little video people have a lot of uh, references and nostalgia about hammering or and and so what they see is one thing but what your brain conjures up uh, is another thing as well. So it is uh, not a, the same experience, but I think you can pad it out with extra bits and pieces that brings a fuller experience to, 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 the, to the audience or the gallery goer, which, uh, which, is, which is positive as well. Thank you. Anybody else on this question? Um, maybe Harry can add something about the sounds and how sound can help us experience um, the, the touch, you know. 
So, you know, I mean, it's like, because actually sound is, it's very tactile as well, you know, it's, it goes straight to our, it tags our skin and our ear. So it's, it comes somehow transforms that, um, something unique about sound in that it, out of the all the senses it's the only one that has a a sort of one-to-one -one relationship with the outside world so our eyes um you know are converted through the, the retina and then our brain in, does a lot of interpretation whereas with sound if there's a vibration at 440 hertz then the neuron that is connected to the um part of the ear that resonates with that fires at 440 hertz so it kind of connects with us uh, uh through our um through, through that way very directly um but of course you don't you don't touch it um but uh there is something lost when you don't see the performer because so much context has changed um but of course i think compared to the other um uh disciplines that are represented here music perhaps is at a, an advantage in terms of going online compared to other things because we can still listen um and have a personal experience um so let's talk about why craft matters um why do we strive to keep traditional techniques and skills alive it is not the case that craft is more than just a way of making things I mean, we, I strongly believe, and I think Mika also, is uh, it's like craft is a language and a way of thinking. It is also a lifestyle choice for some and an escape for the others. What are your thoughts on these issues? Um, shall we start from, with Peter? Yes, I mean, this is really key for me in my work is this idea of, of craft thinking, um, and in particular because of my training, textile thinking. Um, and um, it's uh, foundational for my PhD. It's my methodology, really, for my PhD um, is textile thinking. So um, it brings to bear uh, uh, ways of um, approaching um, ideas or uh, ways of looking um, and um, the, the metaphors used in textiles are just uh, so important um, in our everyday lives. We, we constantly are referring to textile metaphors. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the physicist David Bohm used the textile metaphor to explain the very, very difficult ideas of um, uh, quantum physics, um, uh, the idea of um, enfolding and unfolding, and that everything we experience is the unfolded. Um, aspect and underlying that is an enfolded order we talked about them as orders and um, so this idea of textile thinking is really important um, to me and to the way that I approach um, what I'm doing um, so um, and just the way that I approach the materials that I use to explore those ideas and to present the ideas um, so, uh, uh, that's, that's really important to me. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to say that um, as a maker or somebody engaged with materiality, I think tools to a craft person are the most important things to have. And I think we always, makers are always problem solving. So actually, you know, if I'm making something on a pottery wheel, can I make a rib out of um, a shoe before it gets thrown away? The metal, the in the steel toe cap, that can become a new tool, and that's sort of um, something that I can create my the, the the tools for the job. And I think pushing into digital ways of making, it's not in competition with traditional ways of craft. It just extends the possibilities of making and extends the possibilities of communication and language. So that's that's how I see uh, tradition, that it will, will continuously evolve uh, because of the things we want to say and, and to help us to, to create work. Thank you. Um, is anyone else would like to add something on that? Hermione? Or Peter? 
Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm reiterating really what Michelle and Peter have said in some ways that textile traditions um, are the foundations um, for innovation and it's about moving forwards. I mean, much of what I've been working with includes, um, like I've said, the ancient um, material felt, but I've been laser cutting. So, you know, using a very contemporary process along with these traditional materials is, is what excites me and many makers um, and keeps this um, energy flowing. Thank you. Uh, Mirka, would you like to... Well, I would like to bring her in at this point because I remember we had a conversation at when I was visiting uh, UCA once and Harry actually said something um, about textiles being pivotal for development of... Um, correct me, I will be totally wrong, but you know, this totally mm -hmm. blew my mind. Was it de development of synthesizers? Well, com computers really. Yeah. Um, so the, the Jacquard loom uh, is, is, is programmed uh, essentially. And um, the uh, Charles Babbage who um, created uh, the, um, the difference engine uh, which was the first programmable computer. Um, the, the first computer program, which is where um, it's programmed in a general sense, was done uh, arguably by uh, Ada Lovelace, who was the daughter of Lord Byron um, and also the daughter of a, a mathematician. There was a bit of a conflict between science and uh, poetry in her household. Um, anyway, and it's also what my daughter's named after, Ada. Um, but so Ada Lovelace wrote, understood that um, that you could program things generally, but the mechanical part of that was inspired by the Jacquard loom and the way that you uh, program uh, the, the weaving structures. So there's a there's a there's a link there. Of course, it was never it was never built, and it, w it had to wait until Alan Turing to really um, rediscover it. Um, but the elements were were there. Um, and in, in, and punch cards even after that. So the, the technology of, um, of the Industrial Revolution was really quite, really very sophisticated um, yeah, and ahead of its time. So I, I think this is just really interesting how craft practice feeds into other practices and, and, and crosses science and technology and kind of leads on to progress. Um, shall I ask the next, next question? Well, do you want to, to add, shall we say, um, uh, Manuela's reply on that, about how she feels about um, the craft knowledge? Shall I, shall I read it? So Manuela says that uh, she completely, completely agree. You cannot replace someone's knowledge of how to make something with a book. A lot of artists find calm and relaxation in their making or voice their opinions. For me, craft is my way of communicating my experiences to help people understand. It's actually to create awareness and adds up a bit more to that, like all that crossovers between um, how craft is embedded in everything, like, you know, how to, it's, it's similar to um, everyone's practice, actually, how to, you know, through something that is very familiar, we can develop uh, the understanding and create an awareness of more complex um, thinking. Yeah. So we move to the next question. So the next question is about material. We usually talk about the material nature, material knowledge and material application. What part does the vulnerability and the strength of materials play both in the making process and in the finished form of the objects made or buildings built. Is that material nature an attraction or destruction for artists? So um, I think I would like to start with Michelle possibly here, if you could lead us in, please. Um, materiality for me, um... You know, the, it, ceramics is process based, so I may create a material that can be 3D printed or I could um, 
you know, program a robot to CNC the surface of clay, but actually it, it, it has a, it changes state once it's in a kiln and it's being fired. So actually there's always a chance encounter within that. So you're working um, with the stages of, of material and transformation and that transformation comes about through process. Um, I wouldn't say it's a distraction. I'd say it's um, it, it, it's compelling. I think um, the, the reactions that, that I get in my practice and especially by using the limestone within the ceramics and actually I don't really know what happens until I open the kiln and the pieces have been fired to different temperatures. So it, it, it really is, um, the, the material is, it is driving the aesthetic. I'm, I'm just merely sort of shuffling it in, into quantities, but it, but it really is that process that's, that's um, creating the, the artifact. I think this is, this is a fascinating question. We, in our um, masons um, yes. replace stone at various points of the, uh, on the cathedral. The, the limestone we use is not the hardest of stones, uh, but it, it, it varies in density. And uh, that one of the things they have to do, uh, and, and indeed our clerk of the works has to do when he's buying the stone, is to look at a piece and say, you know, how hard is this? How soft is it? If it's harder, it can be used in the more exposed part of the building. The softer stone can be used in the more protected part. And um, I think we're seeing this with the, the coronavirus. You know, a challenge gone wrongness and constraint actually is a, is a huge stimulus to, to creativity. So the vulnerabilities and strengths of materials, I, I, I guess for talking to the more creative people in the room, um, that presents you with a, a set of, of, of constraints which um, uh, can actually generate possibilities that uh, you might not have seen otherwise. Yes, I, I think craftspeople do become a particular problem solvers through the understanding of the materials that they use and having to overcome all sorts of um, problems but and challenges they then become the masters of that material and yes i think uh, i think michelle put it extremely well so i really have no more to add to that the only thing i would say is that it's the vulnerability of the materials sometimes that it sounds a bit um untechnical but it really brings the magic to a piece the, the thing we, we have so much control over we want so much control over everything in our lives but actually within process and materials we we have to lose control to to get something else that is very uh very individual to to that particular uh, uh part of the process okay thank thank you i will kind of finish off with harry if i may um i was really astonished by the materiality of sound when i witness what you did at Salisbury Cathedral and what it to me what it seemed like was you were basically filling the cathedral with a material which the sound was at that time can you can you say a few words about materiality of sound perhaps yeah other than um than, than the the relationship to the ear it does take space to create a sound um, so, you know, a wavelength is a physical length um, and, and low frequencies are very long, you know, in the, in the range of uh, meters for really low sounds. Um, so the project is with um, the first composer in residence, Amy Brown, who um, is working with me to, um, to develop this uh, concept and, and composition. Um, so we're using um, the sound of um, a, a cello as a performative element um, and also the recordings that are being made by the other makers um, are then sounding those through the um, the idea is through through the, the actual space of the cathedral or at least the virtual representation of it that that we took uh, when you came uh, with us that that, um, that evening 
and there's something really special about um, how your ears tell you the size of a of a space uh, really quite accurately. If you walk into a building, you know how how big the building is without uh, just through the ambient sound, even with your eyes closed. And uh, I think that's one of the things that a space like Salisbury Cathedral, it's so unusual to be in some, something so cavernous. Um, and it's uh, quite a disorientating thing. Uh, and using the material, I suppose, of, of sound makes that kind of clear, you know, where the, where the, where the physical boundaries of, of the roof and the walls and the ceilings and, and so on are. So it, it, does, it does feel different subjectively different to sound things within a, an, uh, a cathedral compared to any other space. They're really unique um, things. When we, when we were there, what it felt like for me to watch you doing the process of capturing the reverberation was when Potter is using a mould and mm. filling it uh, with, a, with a slip to cast every nook and cranny of that mould which the cathedral then mm. became. Um, I think if we can talk some more about sound, I will hand over to Lucia to ask the next question. Thank you, Mirka. Actually, it was a really good question for the question we have now, which is about sound. So uh, our question is, sound informs our making and helps identify which steps of the process, process we have reached and if it is going well or not. So actually as makers, but as people as well, you know, we can identify our everyday sounds and we know things going right or wrong. How can responding to the sounds of making or creating a new music composition put us in touch with those hidden unacknowledged, uh, unacknowledged features of craft and the craft process? And I think I should ask, ask, ask Harry first, and then, um, and then Peter, and then, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, th I think that in terms of this project, um, the fact that, that it's been curated as an invitation for makers to um, make, make a, a new material out of their work, um, so I've been collecting uh, the first submissions from uh, the, the various craft makers of the recordings of their their sounds. Um, this is something which, you know, uh, Amy, James and I are quite used to dealing with and thinking about. Um, but I'd be quite interested, I suppose, in, in hearing how, uh, how that invitation has, um, uh, what other people think about that invitation and if it's made them think about their own craft differently or a different aspect to it. I mean, I think as um, as a maker, I think we're always immersed in the sounds of um, materiality and making, and it is an indication whether things are going wrong. I think things need to make a certain sound for us to carry on, or change a blade, or think about the speed of a wheel. In my case, I've been doing some sound recordings of of throwing clay, and then you will have sound recordings from three D printers, which I can. A completely different sound and it, and it totally makes a sound of music um, a kind of dance music depending on on the, the form it's printing and again that's an indication if things are going right or wrong so really being immersed within sound as a maker is is something that we're always embracing we have to because it's an indication of what we're doing is is right if that makes sense and I'd just like to add to that, that, you know, the fully immersive um, act of making tends to lead you, depending on what your practice is, into, in a sort of mindful state. So part of my research was this sort of act of uh, making that became very much cathartic and um, the healing sense from grief. So that uh, you, the sound was very repetitive with um, when, what, what I was doing with um, putting hairs, human hairs into um, the surface of the felt. So that was really repetitive and, you know, very much like Michelle mentioned about that sort of dance, that, that, that um, happy sound that, you know, just became quite a mindful act actually. 
Um, it's really a footnote to what Hermione just said about the um, immersive aspect of, of what you hear in an activity. There, there's, a, there's a great line of Eliot, T.S. Eliot in the Four Quartets, where he, he talks about music heard so deeply that it is not heard, but you are the music while the music lasts. And um, I, I just thought of those, those, that line when Hermione was speaking. Um, thank you. Actually, this is why I thought Peter would be, um, I mean, based on, on, on that T.S. Eliot's actually Fort Quartet was bringing us that, you know, like time is, and place and space and music is doing that sort of thing, which is actually something that Peter's um, uh, research is all about, you know, the, the, that continuum of type, time and, and, and space and repeated, uh, repetitiveness. So, uh, Peter, would you like to give us your um, view? A sound. Well, just in terms of the making, because I'm using so many different materials, every material comes with different kinds of sounds and, and some of them not very much sound at all. Um, so um, uh, there's that aspect. I was kind of interested in what Harry was saying about the wavelengths of sound because yes. I'm looking at the wavelengths of light. Yes, exactly. The continuum there between sound and light and the, the wavelengths and, and frequencies is the same language really, but just uh, our senses pick them up in different ways. Um, so um, the, the, the light frequencies are much higher frequency than the sound frequencies, um, but it's the same continuum. Um, and I'm kind of thinking about what uh, the scientist who I mentioned, David Bohm, um, talked about matter as being frozen light. So um, he was kind of seeing that um, the, those aspects of light become frozen and um, even matter has frequencies and resonances so, um, and, and energies that, that vibrate. Um, I don't know if that's what, what you were kind of asking about, but um, <laughs> that's ah. the things I think about. No, thank you. Um, no, thank you. Um, anyone else would like to add something? Back to the sound, or I, I wanted to say that a part of Salisbury life, I think, um, or one of the sounds of Salisbury is when you walk past the cathedral and you walk, walk towards Harnham Gate and you might witness the rehearsal that you hear coming out of the cathedral and then you walk, walk past the works yard and you will hear the ryth rhythmical sounds that the work works yard um, sort of omits and um, yes so in terms of the sounds that the building makes I think it's 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 really quite um, interesting and I was going to ask Robert if if he has kind of feeling on this yeah I think you've just given me an idea for a commission <laughs> that we, we get on to our director of music who's a composer as well as a conductor of the choir and say yes, we we want we want we want something that um, draws on the musicality of the cathedral and its and its craftspeople. I think that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> Look here, the Legends is all about catching the sounds of the making and the sounds of the cathedral. And I think uh, Harry would add um, something more. Um, later on, but actually we can, um, Harry can talk about uh, a bit more about the composition and the whole idea. So as part of our experiments in terms of um, creating this impulse response, we also swept up through different frequencies and uh, heard that some frequencies resonate um, more than others and this is to be expected in any in any space you know the resonant frequency of a bathroom goes really well with our singing you know which is why we do it um, but you would expect most symmetrical things to resonate in a logarithmic curve um, because octaves double in that sort of logarithmic uh, way whereas actually we found some really interesting and strange quirks of the cathedral space where there were resonances spaced in a linear way which is 
quite an unnatural thing. Um, so the composition is uh, using the cello to resonate those particular um, nodes, those particular frequencies that the cathedral has told us uh, it, if you like, prefers in some sense. So it's really an attempt to integrate a performative aspect with a cello, harking back to the um, the fact that it, it's a musical building, um, that that we have the sounds of the the of the materials of the craft making um, being played back through uh, speakers, um, and then the actual uh, blueprint of the the acoustic space to integrate all those th three things um, together in a way that sort of tells the story of all those aspects of its of the building of its use um of its uh of its future and of, of its of its past i suppose um so that's 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 the um that's the aim um and i'm working on that as i said with uh, amy brown as a uh, who's doing much more of the the uh, technical parts where the um, speaker array will be able to respond to the performance and to the sounds um, uh, in in real time. So there's a technological look forward, um, as uh, other people have talked about. You know, three D printing as as a counterpart to making with the hands. This is this is part of our toolkit now, isn't it? Uh, digital tools. And and it was the sort of it was the craftsmanship and the skill and the energy that goes into all those craft practices that feeds into this composition. Yeah. And so I will lead on to the next question, um, which is about making process. So is it the sense of profound experience together with the process of making that allows the interpretation of difficult or complex subjects and questions? And is experience essential for being able to see that one creative discipline can expand and feed off into another or into another area of inquiry. So um, I think if I um, start actually with Manuela's uh, reply to this, Manuela um, went right in there and said, I don't think experience is essential. Sometimes lack of experience means that we are able to think outside of the box and try new techniques or combinations. So what do you think? Sometimes the simplest things are the most effective. And sometimes for me, too many words confuse the issue. And, and if you can see how a piece is made and talk about the process and the techniques that is something that everybody can associate with in some shape or form. Uh, and the profound experience, we can all get an awful, we can get quite bogged down in profound experiences and the practicalities of making are, are simple and clear and, and, and everybody can associate with that in, in some way or shape or form. Uh, Robert, please. Another thought that occurs to me is, is whose experience? Um, we, we have, uh, for instance, uh, very young people who sing in our choir, but they sing ancient texts. And in one of them, uh, 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 one of the Psalms, it begins, out of the depths I've cried to thee, O Lord. And if you can contemplate another person's experience of joy or despair, um, I, 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 I think that, that can be, um, that can be a, 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 a real fountain of, of creativity. Um, and I think, I think it's quite important not to make an idol of our own experience. Uh, I, think, I think there's a, a considerable danger in that. Thank you. Can I ask Hermione at this point, because Hermione, you are um, bridging your practice with a particular experience. Uh, do you want to comment on this question? Um, I think... Um... There are two sides to the coin and in some ways having a freshness and a you know the naivety in, a, in approaching something new um can bring unexpected creative results and, and you know i relish in that because 
as a textiler, I'm always um, um, enjoying experimenting. That that's part of the, my nature as a maker. Um, but with regards to the work that I've made, actually intellectualizing the, the the subject of loss has fueled my practice. And thinking and making have become um, synonymous with one another. And uh, actually, having experienced loss myself. Um, was the starting point actually for my making and that then led me um, to look at other artists around the globe um, who also have responded and who act um, um, on behalf of others. Um, Doris Salcedo, Colombian artist, um, responds to the political atrocities that um, have happened um, in South America and she, she feels it's her duty to respond in that way um, and she's always empathizing with those through her art so I feel that um, I, I understand on one half you know the act of making in its simplistic form is a human need and actually just engaging with materials is really um, central to our core as a maker and, and actually just a, a person um, you know being creative is really really key but actually like i'm saying from from um with regards to human condition i think actually experiencing that makes your work possibly um, more powerful because you can empathize and reach out to others um that way um can i add something here yeah. um I was I was thinking. I mean, there's a two 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 ways to go because I mean, one is about experience and what you're doing, you're making, how experienced you are in your um, in your craft. So I will bring as an example, Cara, that she came as a metal uh, worker at at uh, UCA to do her masters, and then she started incorporating glass, where she had a huge experience in fine arts, metal work, but was but. Um, Correct me if, if I'm wrong. Uh, glass was a very new material for you. That, however, you had your your craft thinking. So you were a very experienced maker, but you didn't have any experience in glass. And I think this is wh wh why I think uh, Manuela's is interesting because I mean, um, when Cara went into the glass making, she didn't have any not clue, but she didn't know what uh, it was. Very uncharted territories about how the material is is uh, working. So actually, she could experiment more with that new material that she would do if it's, she was more experienced. So I think this is why it led to do a very different and really strong new work that plays with tensions, materiality, um, and has a lot of contradictions because she's using like very solid uh, materials, but they're very uh, fragile at the same time. You know, if you don't hang her piece in the right way, it's very, you know, the, the, the tension is really, um, um, it, it needs to, you know, you need to set an experience, that's what I'm trying to say, to do something, but in experience to something else in order to have a combination. Does that make sense? Cara, would you like to add something on that? Um, yeah, that's exactly right. And I think sometimes I needed to have the experience of the metal, but having the naivety of not knowing, I, I couldn't, I didn't know what was wrong. And, and I think that that is where maybe there's something in this is where the old techniques uh, overlap with the new, more modern techniques. It's all about how you come to it with, a fresh, with fresh eyes. And if you're told, uh, possibly like th through the old apprenticeship system, this is how it goes, this is what you do, how you forge metal, you can make a point, a scroll, a piece of leaf work, that's fantastic, but you also need to be able to take it on to the next level and having that naivety and freshness and uh, uh, is essential. So, so I don't know really quite how I'm, if I'm explaining that well, but you, you, you need the information, but it's what you do with that information. That, and, and if you have no preconceptions, you possibly can come up with something a little bit different. Uh, so, so maybe too much knowledge is, is not always uh, a, a good thing. Uh, does anyone want to um, say something more? 
it depends, Michelle, maybe, that you're using, um, you know, like 3D technologies, tr very traditional ceramic making with very innovative and experimental um, technologies. Yeah, I'm very, um, I've been trained to work with my hands um, and I really started to embrace digital technology out of absolute curiousness. Um, and also, you know, this just expands, yeah, problem solving, um, an extension of my practice. So learning new digital skills, learning to um, design on a computer, um, but all those skills that I've um, gained as a craftsperson is, you know, I couldn't 3D print without my knowledge of, of clay with it with a craftsperson. You know, you can't, you know, um, it's just an extension of my making skills and thinking, ah, oh, what happens if I work in this way, a wedge clay as I normally do, but put it through a machine that can coil rather than coil by hand, that it's coiled digitally. You know, it's, it, it's um, I guess it's using my existing knowledge to problem solve a new technology. And, and that's what I'm finding super exciting as a way of developing my, my practice. Um, and also because I've come from metal work as well, you know, I can make tools for the machine as well if, if I need to change a nozzle, you know, so it, it's about expanding um, on the knowledge, you know, to just create tools for future work um, in an experimental fashion. Thank you. Um, can I ask Robert a question? Uh, about because I mean when we visited the cathedral the workshop we saw that the ma masons they still use they don't use digital uh, computer to, to to spot which um, stones they will they would like to replace or fix however they have um, we saw that they have incorporated all new type of machinery to uh, help them with the everyday works in the department. So I would like to have your point of view on oh, uh, that yes. combination, you know, like very traditional uh, skills and thinking carries on from 800 to today and some very contemporary stuff of uh, equipment and tools. Yes, I, I play a, a thought game with myself sometimes and think if, if we could get a, a 13th century mason or glazier to time travel to the workshop now, and took them round on a tour. What would be the points where you know their their eyes would would, would glisten with tears and they say, "Gosh, you're you're still doing it how we did." And what are the points which they say, "You're mad. Are you still doing it that way?" You know, surely you must have found a better way than that. And um, we, our my colleagues in the works department, tread tread that uh, tread tread that line. And I, I think I think uh, it, it's really it's a matter of respect and honour for traditional methods without being precious. Um, it would clearly be insane to use a handsaw to go through a half ton block of stone when we have a very, very good German power circular saw that can do the job, you know, in 20 minutes instead of it taking a couple of days. Um, similarly, we, 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 we use, um, our, my colleagues use, use a mallet and a, and a chisel, but the, the, the mallet, the dolly it's called now, is now nylon head rather than wooden and the tip of the chisel will be tungsten rather than iron or steel. And that, that seems to me to be a, 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 a very mature melding of, of that which has been handed on to us from previous uh, eras uh, and that which we're able to do now uniquely because we're, we're modern. And um, yeah, so, so um, um, a, a way, a way back Cara used, a, I thought, a really powerful word. She talked about a nostalgia in the techniques. And that there is bad nostalgia, but there's good nostalgia. That it, it, the word means a longing for home when you're not at home. And um, uh, I think it's, it, it, we, it, as long as we do not allow ourselves to be too much estranged from the fundamentals of life, you know, as we are with, you know, food production, for instance, you know, we, we wouldn't know what to do if we were put on a farm, most of us. Um, as, as long as we don't let that estrangement become total, I think we can really make the most of the opportunities we have as, as 21st century human beings, um, while still being enriched by what our, our forebears have, have handed on to us. 
Mm. I think this leads us really nicely towards the last question. What do you think, Lukia? Um, I think yes, and I think actually the last question wraps up whatever we discussed today. And uh, the question is, how does cross-disciplinary practice open up to new ways of making and thinking about craft in the future? Well, I think that the, the, uh, the great thing of, of, of working across, across disciplines is that you do have the ability of mixing the old techniques with the new processes. And, and this is probably going to be the only way that we can keep all of our craft processes uh, accessible and available for the next generation. Uh, because of, I think, I feel that from this discussion, the one thing I've got is that if we lose the old, we can't continue to go with any particular depth towards the new. Yeah. I think that's, that's I was a really, uh, really good point, actually very strong point um, to keep from this. Um, and I think that ties very well of what Robert said about the two different, like the old, you know, the way they decided to go forward in some cases with the work they did in the cathedral and keep some old um, ways of working, let's say. And, uh, Cara and um, Michelle, what do you like to add? Um, I think it, um, embracing new ways of making and new technologies, it keeps us relevant in the contemporary world, but it's also expanding our field of craft um, and it's expanding on um, yeah the knowledge we know and love um and we can we can keep being relevant by developing it and um fresh harry would you like to say, talk about that cross-disciplinary practice that i know that you are very um much advocate of and uh, maybe talk to us about um the yeah that. Yeah, I think it's one of the exciting things. I mean, we, we this connection with UCA is um, it kind of means that we all have uh, cross disciplinary uh, sort of understanding at our core in many in many ways, um, because you're uh, juxtaposed with people from similar but different practices, you know, and um, one of the things that I find really uh, delightful as a uh, in conversation about practice is when you're having your own struggle in your own field and then you're talking to somebody in a totally different discipline and they've they've they can help you sometimes get past a particular hurdle if you've got a mental block or or just a different way of approaching it or very often having to explain something in a different way makes you understand what you were doing better yourself so it's not a, it's not really a luxury i think it's really a part of it's really essential in order to change and move forward and not just go around in in, in loops um and everything really even if you're uh you know working on your own workshop and it's very isolated ultimately whatever it is that you make i suppose you want to show in front of somebody else um i mean you could you could hoard it in your your cave of objects i suppose but then that's not that's not what we do is it so even the act of showing or telling your uh, uh your work to someone is even that is is a collaboration um i i, I think about uh, i'm used to working in a very improvisational way with my own musical background and uh and when i write music down i think of that as a sort of frozen collaboration that is then um you know at some point maybe that collaboration happens and i think that's a similar thing with objects as well you know something's made and then a little moment of collaboration happens when when you when somebody else looks at it or picks it up um uh and this is one of the things that that we do get i suppose even with with uh zoom this is why this sort of thing is important to 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 do to carry on so um yeah, it's really, it's an essential part of it. It's, it's fundamental. It's totally fundamental. Robert? One aspect of the, the, the world we've been forced into, as we're doing now, is, is to get to grips with being filmed and filming and recording and so on. Um, 
in terms of new ways of making, to, to what extent would you be happy in the future for the, the act of making itself to become part of the art, as it were, to be observed and, and listened to, and, and perhaps possibly to be in some sort of dialogue while you're making the art, as well as being in dialogue once you've made the art and it's then offered to your audience? Can I can I answer just from a teacher's perspective as a that it's that cycle of um, learning, engaging, making, sharing, you know, that Harry was just talking about that I guess is quite natural for me um, because obviously I'm sharing um, skills and with joy sitting back and watching um, young people take those skills into new directions. And, you know, I get pleasure out of that. Um, uh, watching them develop as um, artists and designers themselves so I think that that's really interesting in terms of how um, craft is being passed down and uh, sharing so in answer to your question Robert I guess from from my point of view that that seems almost the norm I'm not sure about the film because there's some sort of um, finality about that and then that being shared without my permission necessarily <laughs> I know not necessarily here but um that's o opening up a whole new realm of um <clears throat> possibilities I guess but that is exciting about talking about education and how uh, the new generation will embrace uh, digital technology and traditional ways of making and where they will take that next and actually being part of that journey and informing that journey with the students is really exciting to see how they can expand upon your knowledge and, and that's very exciting for me. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the film thing is incredibly exciting to, to make us making and and also i mean I've, I've you know i've got one of my children is currently you know online and she she's she's 16 so she's having some very close encounters with her teachers on online and and i think possibly getting to know them and her them getting to know her much better um so so maybe that one of the best solutions might be some sort of um uh, making being filmed but then having a, a conversation online as well about that and and that would possibly give a very very complete experience um and, and i and i think the, the filming of you know which i've been doing and probably several of you have been doing during this lockdown time has has been incredibly um expanding really for for the practice and for thinking how your practice because you have to be Michael um, and, and edit it and edit the, whatever you're creating um, and that in itself is is quite valuable so, so I think the film thing has got great potential really thank you so, um, Mirka shall we wrap up or, or yeah. shall we move to the Q&A maybe yeah I shall I I will wrap up I will uh, just mention um, Manuela's reply um, Manuela did um, also say that uh, marrying two different materials together or using two materials will create a unique object. And um, she is also saying that um, uh, during uh, through collaboration, you stand a bigger chance of survival. And I think I want to build up on this because the reason for this exhibition is um, or one of the reasons um, and how it came about is through cross-disciplinary practice and also through Lucia knowing me for the projects I did as an artist, um, crossing disciplines and collaborating with others. And I think it is really a very important way of driving our practices forward because if we cannot work in isolation um, because if we do our practice will become stagnant um, creative process is a conversation is a collaboration and um, so I think that is the future of for craft practice uh, is, is looking elsewhere and work together
Shall we ask, shall we ask, uh, um, at, you know, like, uh, open up the conversation to the audience? Okay, so yeah, there was one from Laura Lee. Can you see it, Lucia? Yes, um, it says, I like the comment of immersion and material and sound and connection to dance, something to relate in, uh, to her practice, which is about, I mean, Laura is one of the PhD students at UCA, and she's the first um, com music composer in, um, PhD student, student at UCA. So, um, hi, would you like to answer? Um... Yeah, I mean, she's absolutely right. Um, that, 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 you know, that we all have bodies. Um, and so, you know, there's a, um, and at the mo moment, it's easy to forget that in a way, isn't it? We're, we're, we're dangerously going towards brains in vats. Uh, so anything to, that we can do to remind ourselves that, that you know, in, for instance, music is also movement is, uh, it's a good thing. I think I think that's been a danger for a while, though. It's not a new thing, is it? Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I think there's that, that counter um, um, argument from makers that actually, when they're making the you know the sounds of they're making everything. I mean, the, what the, the body is dancing when they're making. And if you if you are very experienced maker, I mean, um, maybe can say that or um, everyone, anyone here. I mean, like Michelle that when she's throwing, throwing is like a dance. You know, it's like, um, it's, I don't know, that's my... Yeah, it's the physicality of movement within a craft practice, yeah. yeah. Obviously it's not like the music as we say, but it's all those sounds that they're part of our everyday life. Um, what I realized is that we, we kept a really interesting thread going all around all the different questions and what came out is like that everyone is trying to push the boundaries of their own making i mean physicality is really essential to us as human beings and obviously as craft makers and moving to a different sort of a digital um environment or more like abstract environments like you know like um doing virtual exhibitions or um communicating what we're doing in in with in within different platforms, it actually is, as Michelle re rightly said, is not competitive, but actually is adding up to um, our practice. And uh, Robert gave some really interesting examples of, you know, like of, of, of from the cathedral, how um, if you use a digital technology in um, a positive, you know, with certain ways, it can actually be more inclusive and democratize uh, many aspects of our everyday life. Um, I, I think what came out from here is actually is like cross-disciplinary practice is essential to uh, to, to us. And one of the th of the reasons I act as, as I initially approached Mirka to do that project was because I knew her cross-disciplinary practice, and I was very fond of her maker uh okay as a maker you know like the way she's um repeating testing her glazes she's doing some she has i mean for for you that you don't know Mirka's work she's doing some amazing glazes it's a very traditional uh ceramic maker but also she has instigated lots of different projects to involve filmmaking dancing um lights um sound uh different ways of sewing so she's um very much and and she has recently she did a really interesting community project that she was involving um, her community to bring their stories, their tales into, you know, to communicate, to share their stories with her. And then she was doing some really interesting uh, cross-disciplinary, um, I've not, I don't want to go into details about that, but uh, what I'm saying is like, it's really interesting to see how something very traditional can become some, can be so, contemporary and relevant to today. And I think what we discussed today, that, you know, that was evident in, within what we discussed today. Um, I would like just to um, read my acknowledgements, because I don't want to. I would like to say uh, thank you to the University for the Creative Arts, and especially uh, Professor Colin Holden, uh, the head of School of Craft and Design, who identified the potential of this project and gave his full support as well as Dr. Harry Worley, Senior Lecturer in Performing Arts, who embraced the project's idea from the very beginning, beginning and he was really supportive uh, to the whole process. Um, I'm great, great, grateful to Wildside Creative, and particularly to Mirka, 
Golden Horn, uh, the residence artist and head of visual arts and co-curator of the project, who offered me this opportunity to work with her in this ambitious collaborative project. And it's uh, I'm very, um, you know, I'm very thrilled to see it coming together, especially, you know, and, and, and Mika worked really, really hard to help to bring everything together. And finally, I would like to express my gratitude to Salisbury Cathedral, uh, the craft workers, uh, staff and volunteers, especially Mary Thomas, who welcomed the idea and accommodated the project to develop. And, um, and Robert for being here today and um, giving us all those insights from uh, the cathedral point of view. And just to say that, that this is a very important project for me because this will be, um, as you, you already know, as part of my PhD study and that will be included in my um, PhD thesis. Thank you, Lucia, and thank you everybody for participating. It is really okay. interesting, thank you. <laughs> it is really interesting to see how in the time of lockdown and in a time of isolation, we are all kind of in a way forced to reflect and reevaluate. Re and uh, we are given the chance to reminisce as well as learn new sets of skills which we will build on going forward. Um, but we will always look towards creativity as means of understanding, absorbing, experiencing and communicating. So for now, like everywhere else, our buildings are closed, but uh, we still work on our cultural content to engage, inspire and most of all to connect. Um, and so if you are watching and if you are arts enthusiast or a student or an artist aspiring as well as well season, uh, please do visit our website um, to experience the content and to take advantage of all the opportunities listed. And if you have a burning question about Maker's Tale or anything else, do feel free to get in touch. Look after yourself and thank you and see you soon. That's really done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.